Welcome everyone to the first episode of the Omni Challenge and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host Vanessa Horwell and I'm here with Tim Mason, co-host. Um, he is a serial marketer, uh, omni-channel advocate. He's the author of Omnichannel Retail, How to Build Winning Stores in a Digital World and the CEO of Eagle Eye. Tim, welcome. This is our first recording together. I know we're going to have some great discussions in our series about this pivotal retail um, business and really customer redefining uh, topic. Today, we're going to talk about the long road to omni-channel enlightenment. Um, as someone who's worked with retailers and marketers since before mobile was a thing, I remember when we thought, uh, in many cases, still think about these many different customer channels that we needed to conquer, not this sort of single big, all-encompassing one. Um, it's been a very long road from then until now. So I thought we could start there um, with the why. Uh, why write a book about omnichannel retail when um, marketers and retailers have been thinking and living and, and breathing omnichannel for all of these years? Um, it's That's a very interesting question, isn't it? I, I think... I mean, I suppose the first thing is the dirty secret is the the book didn't start out as being omnichannel anything. It started out as being how to out Amazon Amazon. And my publisher, excuse the dog barking in the background, uh, early in the podcast, uh, we have uh, the joys of Zooming. Um, yeah, my publisher wouldn't allow me to call it that. So uh, we then scratched our heads and uh, sort of came up slightly reluctantly with omnichannel. I think you've done rather well to call it omnichallenge. I think that's, uh, if anybody actually notices that you've made that subtle change. I think omnichallenge is, is it arguably is why I wrote the book, I suppose, which is that um, I think that, I suppose if, if I try and characterize it as succinctly as I can, that I think that everybody has quite rightly focused on e-commerce, the new channel, the new revenue stream, the new way hopefully to make money, and has completely ignored the fact that the consumer is always on, always connected, and that that has tremendous implications for businesses that exist in the real world, whether they're shops or restaurants or nail bars or coffee, you know, whatever. They, if they exist in the real world, the fact that your customers are always connected is something that's terribly important to you. And by and large, most businesses haven't done very much about it. So really, what and, and the whole argument going back to the how to out Amazon Amazon point was, if you can work out what it means to be always on, if you can connect the consumer online to offline, and if you can market to them appropriately real time in that environment, you actually do have a chance of beating Amazon because it's a richer offering. Mm -hmm than a purely virtual offering. Um, but you've got to do you, you you've got to do it. You've got to take the omni challenge. You've got to pass the omni challenge. And as yet, I think there are very few businesses that are anywhere near doing that. Well, and this sort of brings me to the next point because um, why why is that? Why are, are, are retailers still struggling when there's been, you know, we go back to thinking about when the, the term omni-challenge or omni-challenge channel rather was, was coined back in 2011. So we're talking a decade here. Um, and yet you think of sort of an inflection point in history. Um, and, and to me, I'm sort of thinking about two inflection points that sort of, you know, pre COVID or when you wrote the book, which was 20, 2019 and today. So there's sort of two points in history that I'd, I'd love to, to have you sort of talk us through is, you know, the, the impetus and taking us up to 2019 when um, there was the sort of the retail apocalypse and the demise of a lot of uh, big box and traditional retailers that really hadn't caught up with the digital um, uh, you know, 
the rest of the world's sort of digital imperative. Um, and then, you know, fast forward from 2019 to March 2020 to today, when we've seen this massive shift, I think the shift in digital grocery shopping in the last year has, you know, grown by 42%. Um, that's going to be really hard to sustain that growth, you know, post pandemic. Um, but it signifies a behaviour shift. And retailers must be ready for that. So let's go back to the inflection points that you talk about in your book. Um, I mean, you're, you're right. Retail has always been very competitive and has always had to cope with these changes before. Um, you know, one of the things, think about the implications for retail that the car had, that suddenly you were serving a car-born consumer. And to be honest, I haven't really studied the sociology of this, but I assume that public transport and cars were what spawned suburbs. Without them, suburbs wouldn't work, would they? So, you know, you, you get this tremendous change in, in the demographic, in the population, in where people live and how they want to move. And retail has to change to meet that. Now, Sainsbury's, as it was in the UK, Vons in California, you know, public, those businesses that have been around as long as that, they, they, they coped with that change. That millions of other businesses, sorry, millions is a terrible exaggeration, hundreds of other businesses, you know, and I can list. When I first started in the industry, I was working for Unilever. And our clients were businesses like Templeton and Galbraith's, Fine Fair, International, Mainstop. These are names that won't, won't mean anything yeah. even to a Brit who's younger than 50. You probably actually need to be 60 to, <laughs> to remember those names. You know, they just didn't manage to cope with the change. So now you've got this. And, and I, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is absolutely up there with the motor car i sometimes you know joke it's uh, it, that 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 i think probably the, the the development of the internet is as central to the development of mankind as the development of caxton's press so you know for for me we've got this sort of mind bogglingly large change in society and Everybody has to respond to it. Um, we play a party game sometimes. We started this at a thing, which was. Do we do we want to share this? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's think of, and I bet I bet actually our listeners could probably get beyond this. But it's think of the numbers of things beginning with M that have been transformed by the internet and you go movies, music, yeah, maps, yeah, media, yeah. you know, it's just, and then we, I cheated and I managed to get photos in as memories and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and doing all this thing. We, we got, it's just incredible how the world has changed in little more than a decade, really. Yeah. You know, the iPhone is 2007. And, um, Retailers have struggled to come to grips with that, to get to grips with that. Well, I, I think that's, it is that transformation. It is, there's the technology piece and obviously sort of what comes before is it, is it um, the realisation that, 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 that we have to change and that as society changes, you said there are things that will happen that then cause something else to happen. Um, you know, digital you know, led to mobile and has led to sort of, you know, e-commerce and digital commerce, and it will continue to evolve. But the behaviours and I guess the operational mindset of these bigger companies, uh, I think that's, and to me, that's where this omni-challenge is for a lot of retailers is that they have this operational structure and that there's all of these pieces around them that they're struggling to adapt to and all of these channels and customer channels and digital channels that they have to incorporate and, and, and change and adapt their business to in order to adapt to how consumers are communicating and living. Um, and that's a constant evolution and, and it's going to continue changing just because you become an omni-channel retailer today doesn't mean that your model can't and, and it must continue to evolve as consumer behaviours and as our 
you know, world evolves. Um, so let's think about that sort of, you know, I guess that digital transformation. And I think that also goes back to um, sort of pre-COVID and, and the reality of when March 2020 hit and, and a lot of retailers going, you know, holy beep, um, we're in this in this world now where a lot more consumers are going to be coming to us online because we can't serve them in any other capacity and we're simply not ready for it. We've been thinking about this imperative and, and need for five years and haven't done a lot about it. Um, and now we have to, we have to play catch up. And then we have all of these other issues on top that we have to deal with supply chain issues, shortages and building an infrastructure where we can start communicating with customers in this condensed time frame. Um, so, so, with sort of that realization and you know 12 months on where you, we can see how it's playing out and these behaviors have changed and they're not going to go back um like all of these other shifts like movies like media you know we're not going to go backwards we're all just going to keep going forwards um so so what's next um you know how um, how do we move forward i mean i think it's interesting isn't it i, I take i agree completely but take slight issue with what you're saying in the sense that and you could be right and I could be wrong but I'll just give you a bit different point of view for the sake of it which is that I think e-commerce was growing substantially and hugely um, and um, different digitally enabled methods of you know you know of grocery retailing meal in a box hello fresh gusto mindful that, those sorts of things they were all doing terribly well uh, ocado you, you know all that sort of thing and ocado going international and, and working with woolies uh coles i think in australia actually i may have got that one wrong and uh with kroger and uh you know this is there's this big development I think that will continue. I'm um, absolute, mm -hmm. and, and as you say, it's it's grown massively. Some people had capacity, uh, and were able. You know, the retailers that were picking from stores had huge amounts of capacity and were able to do a brilliant job and meet that demand. If you're picking from a warehouse, very quickly the warehouse was full and you had to turn customers away, which was terribly disappointing and terribly frustrating. But you know, it was what it was. That isn't going to go backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm less sure that the renaissance that big stores have enjoyed will be sustained. Right. I think that's a very practical, practical, pragmatic thing. I don't want to go to many places. I don't want to see many people. I'm going to do, you know, whereas I think actually the consumer is much more. I don't like to make lists. I like to make, you know, and and so actually the, the more the challenge is disseminated retail closer to where you are and e-commerce with shorter and shorter order lead times so that literally you can as you do with a with you know with a home delivery uh or, or from a restaurant you order and you get it within an hour but i think that i think a lot more things will get will go real time so that's my slight distinction so i so i think in terms of omni channel and why it matters to omni channel you know you were in a situation pre-covid where five percent of your business seven percent of your business was going through e-commerce, the rest was going through your shops. E-commerce was growing. It was irritating that it wasn't profitable. Mm -hmm. And there were glitches, you know, actually, when somebody bought something online, you didn't reflect that in your store inventory, the things didn't line up. Hard to keep your pricing lined up, hard to keep your promotions lined up. Lots of stuff that's sort of not great, but you know, it's on a list, we'll get to it one day. You know you should get to it, but other things take priority. Suddenly, that problem has got twice the size because that 5%'s become 10 and that 7's become 15. So, you know, you've just got more people experiencing the problem more often and going, you know, this is just, this is no way to, no way to run a business. So I think, therefore, the pressure on businesses to resolve it is, is greater. But, you know, Fundamentally, this, this, this thing for me is actually about good marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, marketing is about, 
understanding what you want and giving it to you in a way that's mutually satisfying. You get value from it, and as such, you're therefore prepared to give me something, which means I get value from it as well. You know, it's very, very simple. But that requires and good marketing, good storytelling, it requires you knowing your audience. It requires you knowing who your customers are. Um, and, and, you know, that sort of brings around the question about you know, how retailers that traditionally brick and mortar retailers that haven't had these digital connections with their customers who aren't digitally enabled, um, who have had, you know, established an e-commerce presence. But as you said before, they're disparate, you know, they're looking at install data, they're looking at, you know, e-com data in different ways, and they don't have that sort of cohesive way of understanding their customers. And that's, I think, what the omni-challenge and omni-channel imperative is, is to bring that together and have a way for retailers to be omni-channel like their customers are, because customers don't shop in channels. Um, 100%. I mean, that, that, that's, exa that's exactly the point. And 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 my point is that you've just articulated how it's possible to do this people are too what's lazy what's the challenge no, what's well, the challenge are too, people <laughs> are too lazy people are too lazy to do it they're too lazy to envisage a world where the consumer is properly connected and then too lazy to do it and what what will happen is some people will do it and they will smash those that don't. Because sadly, it's hard to make a decent living being lazy. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I think it's a, it's, it's a real shame. I think some retailers will take exception to that. <laughs> but well, at the I've same time. Of, I've <laughs> sort of done it deliberately. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a, in a way... It, why is anybody going to listen to this podcast? Well, one of the reasons might be is if, I, if, if we say one or two things that people go, whoa, well, that's yeah. a bit close to the knuckle. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how, and this sort of fits into the, something else that you talk about in the book, which is harnessing the power of digital to win at retail. So it's sort of a, a, a paradox, isn't it? Because if you've got retailers that, that aren't the sort of thinking pre-digital, knowing that they have to adapt, how are they going to win? What do they need to do to change? How yeah, do they no, become? I, how do they become these it, technology companies that yeah, are no, retailers? I, I think you're right. I think um, when, in, in some senses, the core discipline, um, Tesco's core discipline during its sort of halcyon days, mid '80s to mid 2000s, 2005s, 2010 was real estate that you know that the, the thing you needed to be really good at was property development finding the right sites developing in the right way um and it, it was the biggest and, and most important it was spent all the money you know spent over a billion pounds a year um and um the chairman was on it the CEO was on it. The managing director was on it. The head of buying was on it. The head of operations was on it. You know, this was the most senior committee, bar the committee that ran the business in the company. My view is, and as, as you said, and that was then, now that committee should still exist, but it should be the digital committee. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you it doesn't, not anywhere. And, but 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 in the way that the bricks and mortar were actually the great enabler of the 80s and the 90s, digital will be the great enabler of, of, of the 2020s. And it needs everybody in the business buying into it, understanding it, investing in it. You are completely right in what you say that by 2030, there will not be uh, successful businesses yet that aren't technology businesses that do retail, technology businesses that do meat, technology businesses that do cosmetics. What you know, and it's the B 
being great at tech and consumer tech and consumer facing tech are going to be table stakes. Which then, because the, the point and the reason why I say to the omnichannel guys, you've got a real opportunity, is they're better merchants. Mm -hmm. They're better curators. They're better product developers because that's their DNA. That's their history, where they come from. And if they could align those tr tremendous skills that they've got, if they could align those to technology, they will create the most wonderful thing. The interesting thing about the technology companies that happen to be retailers, happen mm -hmm. to be food retailers, whatever, um, is they're actually not very good merchants and they're not very good curators and they're not very good developers. So it's brilliant how efficient it is. And you go, whoa, this is efficient. But it doesn't warm your heart and feed your soul. And ultimately, we will gravitate to what warms our heart and feeds our soul, mm -hmm. souls, mm -hmm. I think. But what are these pieces? And I know we're going to cover that extensively in, our, in the rest of our series. Um, what are the pieces that we need to start thinking about to, to bring all this together? Yeah, it's very, it's a very good question. I, I, my starting point is that you need to capture as much data about your customer and what they're doing as you possibly can. Where they're shopping, where they're browsing, how they're spending, when they're spending, what they're doing, you know, which offers may motivate them, which they ignore, L loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff, which ads they look at, which ads they don't look at, whatever. That needs to go to one place, one brain. So big investment, big capability in data analytics and AI around customer data and, and what it means and what it says to us. Now, I'm not really saying anything very new there because if you look at Tesco and Dunhumby, Kroger and 8451, mm -hmm. Woolies and Quantium, Sainsbury's and I2C and Amia, you know, though the, the, the um, casino and uh, a casino have done, you know, these businesses are making investments and, and, uh, and a bit like Remington, they, they liked it so much they bought the company, you know, which is exactly what we did with, with, with Dunhumby. Mm -hmm. I had a row with our head of IT at the time who said, this is a core competence. We should be doing this. What are you doing getting a third party supplier to do it? And I said, you're right. It is a core competence, but we'll be rubbish at it. We need and that. So, Bring it in. Bring it in so, you know, mm -hmm. we bought in and then through time, we did actually buy the company. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, which is, I think, new news, which is the eagle eye news, is from that central brain, you need a central nervous system. Okay. And my argument is that eagle eye is the central nervous system, that the brain works out what you need to do. But then what you, you need is you need one way of firing it to the website, to the app to the shelf edge, to the, to, you know, to the store, what, whatever. And then spotting that the consumer then sees it and does something about it and brings it back. So it, it literally is, I'm going to pick that cup up. Oh, that cup's hot. You know, it's literally working like that. And, and the best analogy, and, what, and one of the things I hope that we'll talk about quite a lot about this is thinking about a central brain and a central nervous system and bringing everything together so that in reality, the brain is getting smarter and smarter and smarter and able. And why does this matter? This matters because it goes back to the point about good marketing. The more I know, the more I understand, the more relevant I can be. That sounds so simple. And yet, you know, when you think of it, the, the way that you have brought it back to things that we all recognize, because when I think one of the challenges is, is talking about omni-channel in, omni channel in sort of technical terms and it, it becomes harder and harder to understand. But when you bring it back to the function of 
thinking and a brain and a central nervous system and storytelling. They're all concepts and, and things that we know about. Um, and it just brings me back. It's so simple, yet so complex to yeah, successfully yeah. execute. Um, you know, and, 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 the, and the, I mean, the only hope I would give is, um, you know, again, and, and actually sort of I'm probably moving now a bit into into the next the next chapter but w w when we started out with the original club card in 1995 data was very expensive to store and it used huge amounts of space and it was just difficult so all you could really all I could really know was that that number was linked to Vanessa, who shopped in that store in Miami, you know, and, 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 and uh, so I knew who you were, where you lived, because I was mailing you the thing, mm -hmm. where you shopped, which you, departments you shopped in, period. That's all I knew. Yep. Yeah. So I, now, of course, the first thing that people said to me, they said, well, this is no good, Tim. If only we knew what Vanessa was buying. And I went through a period of being sort of quite difficult and saying, you know, I've spent a hundred million pounds to get you this information. Don't tell me you can't do anything with it. And of course, the first thing that we learned was that the most important thing about Vanessa was how often she shopped. Yeah. Now, in those days, 20 years ago, Vanessa, I have you down as a very, very big cart shopper, not that frequent. But when I, see, that right. <laughs> when I yeah. see you in the store, I go, whoa, that's a, you know, that's a serious customer. I like that customer. And what I miss is the little old lady who walks past you with a handbasket. Because what I didn't know was the little old lady was coming in five times a week right. and you were coming in once a month. And suddenly when we got customer data, we saw this and we went, wow, the value of frequency was just so much more than you realized. So how do you get people to come more often? Do some A-B testing and do some promotions and see how you get people to come more often. And maybe that would be good. So, you know, people do a lot of work on that. The second thing was, and again, this is, you know, these are statements of the obvious, but until you have the data, you don't know what to do, is that customers who spend more with you, one of the ways they spend more is because they buy meat, produce, health and beauty, wines and spirits, whatever. Customers who don't spend so much only buy grocery. So if you see a customer who's coming quite frequently, so they're quite loyal, they quite like you, but they're only buying grocery, incentivize them to buy produce. Right. Produce, sorry, I forget. I don't know which side of the Atlantic I'm recording. This You've got from. listeners from everywhere, so no, no uh, one's offended. <laughs> and, um, you know, tr try and get them to buy produce or try and get them to buy meat, or try and get them to buy mine. And actually, two, the, the, there were two areas in the early days that were big growth drivers. One was because people wanted to collect these points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One was buy more meat because it's high value. And, yeah. you know, in those days, I hate to tell you, it was so long ago, people used to go to the butcher. And and then the and, and the other area where we, was a lot of growth was in health and beauty. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the supermarkets in the UK particularly gave the boots of this world a very, very hard time through the 90s up to mid 2000s because they just got better and better and better and gave more and more space to health and beauty because it was a, a, an area to grow the business. So now after that, you started to understand the SKUs and what items people were buying and that gave you the next layer. But I always firmly felt that we learned a lot by A, B testing those two very simple things. The third thing that, that, that we did at that time was, you know, the big way that you built new business back in those days was you opened new stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if you could defend your store against a store opening against you, that was a way of keep protecting keep. your business and stopping it from going down. And, and we managed to neutralize all the store openings against us because we knew where our customers were, we knew where they lived, and we knew which ones we had to spend the money on because they were more, there's no point in spending money 
to protect a customer who has to drive past a brand new Sainsbury to get to your older Tesco. Right, right. Somebody, and that's, and, and that's really the, sorry, yeah. Tim, I was going to say that's really the foundation of what's driving, what you're describing is it's the foundation of what today is digital imperative. These are all of the beginnings. Of exactly, yeah. exactly. And yep. now yep. it's a question. And of course, the beauty of it now, the thing that excites me so much now, which we'll come on to talk about, is what I call marketing in the now. But basically, you know, we, we can, I don't have to tell you something before you need it. So it's a bit, well, one day maybe. I don't have to tell you something after it would have had utility, which is just irritating. Yep. I can tell you at the moment that um, there's this, you know, this better thing or this better option or this relative option or this related option or something. And that's great marketing. And people will love it because it's useful, makes their lives easier. And we need more of that, for sure. Indeed. And, and <laughs> you know, I think that is the virtue of good marketing is it makes people's lives easier. Yeah, yeah. And if, if you're a retail, I mean, really any, any consumer facing business, that's your goal. I mean, you want to win the, the heart, the mind and the wallet, ultimately, of the customer. And that's what you should be driving and aiming for. Um, and yes, it's, going, uh, I suppose you've, you've nearly coined a, a new version of that rather rude phrase, isn't it? Which is, uh, and I won't use do the rude one, but it's, you know, if you, get, if you get their hearts <laughs> and you get their minds, their wallets will follow. Their wallets will surely follow. And, and I th I'm, think, I'm sure that's right. Yeah. Yep. Well, and that's going to, that sort of leads us to um, wrapping up this episode. And we're going to explore a lot more um, about those early analog days, because that's really the, the foundation of everything that we're, um, you know, challenged with in today's digital environment. Um, and learning more about the birth of the physical, you know, the, the club card, um, the lessons learnt that are, are still being you know, applied today um, and what the digital imperative means, especially for the retailers that um, are behind um, and, and you know, what their long road ahead will look like um, if, if they're really not, not getting up to speed. Um, we've unpacked a lot here today. I know we've only just scratched the surface, so looking forward to, to learning more about that. Um, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Omni Challenge and thank you so much for joining Tim and I today. We hope to see you all next time. Tim, thank you so much. Thank you, I enjoyed it. Thanks, Vanessa. Take care. To follow along with each episode, you can read Omni Channel Retail, How to Build Winning Stores in a Digital World, why not enter our competition to win a free copy by visiting www.eagleeye.com backslash book competition today.